I'm leaving Quarry Bank Mill, flying north out of rural Cheshire. And below me now, as far as the eye can see, is the urban sprawl of one of Britain's greatest cities, Manchester. It's extraordinary to contemplate, looking down at the sheer size of Manchester today. But before the Industrial Revolution, this place barely existed. In 1750, the population of Manchester was a mere 17,000. The land below me was mostly fields and scattered villages. By 1850, Manchester's population stood at a third of a million. And the march of bricks and mortar out into the countryside seemed unstoppable. For centuries, we'd been essentially an, a rural people. We'd lived on the land. With the coming of industry, all of that changed. Most of us now live in cities or in towns or in the suburbs. Our contact with the land has gone. Well, that transformation began in the early industrial period. And like many profound changes, this one was traumatic. What follows is the story of life in the early industrial cities. It all began with the factories. We came from the countryside to the towns for the promise of work. Once factories like these had been built only in remote river valleys where there was water to power the machines, but all that changed with the coming of steam. All you needed now to power a factory was coal, and coal was plentiful in northwest England. It came to Manchester by canal. And so it was along the banks of the canals the entrepreneurs built their mills, each providing employment for hundreds of workers, laborers from Lancashire and Cheshire, migrants from Ireland, some from as far afield as Italy. They came for a new life. What they found was a glimpse of hell. I'm up on the roof of Murray Mills, one of the oldest factories in Manchester. I'm taking in the view over Ancoats, which was a highly industrial district. The whole of this skyline once would have been peppered with factory chimneys, standing proud like so many cathedral spires. But here's the thing. If you'd actually been up here in about 1830, you'd hardly have seen a thing. With all that coal burning in the boiler houses, the chimneys belched forth this, this dense, poisonous smoke and a, a foul, pestilential smog enveloped the town. For the workers and their families who lived in the houses between these dark, satanic mills, life was about as grim and unhealthy as you could possibly imagine. Just how unhealthy life in Manchester was, was revealed by the town's Board of Health in the year 1832. They'd commissioned an inspection of the streets around Ancoats. There'd been outbreaks of a dreadful disease, cholera, in London, in Glasgow, in Belfast. They wanted to find out the likely danger of a cholera outbreak here. What they found shocked them to the core. Scenes of desperate overcrowding. People 10 or 12 to a room, sharing beds, sleeping in shifts. Cellars never intended for human habitation, rented out by unscrupulous landlords to whole families, sometimes two. Slums, knocked up by builders in search of a fast buck. As many dwellings as possible, crammed into the smallest conceivable space. These back-to-backs lacked the most basic sanitation. They fronted onto yards so small the refuse carts couldn't get access. Filth was everywhere animal, human. Here was squalor of the most degrading kind. Have a look at this. I'm in the northern part of Ancoats now, and down there is what's left of the River Irk, once one of the main arteries of early industrial Manchester. And its banks were lined with fulling mills and dye works and chemical factories, all discharging waste into the water. 
to make things worse, all the way upriver, there were privies, public toilets used by upwards of 100 people. And yet this was the water used by the people around here for cooking, for drinking. And cholera is a waterborne disease. Hardly surprising, cholera did break out in Manchester. Ancoats was hit worst, and the low-lying area around the River Irk was hit worst of all. As the disease claimed its first few dozen victims, a local doctor, a man called Henry Golter, picked his way through the slums, plotting each new case on a map. 200 casualties in Irk Town alone. In a house where this railway viaduct now stands, he recorded the deaths first of Margaret Hanna, age seven, then of her three-year-old sister, Anne, a delicate, half-famished child. She fell sick at seven in the morning, puking up a thin, grayish vomit. By five in the afternoon, she was dead. It's strange, you know. The whole idea of human civilization has always been linked to the process by which human beings leave the countryside and head for the cities. The very words city and civilization, they're linked. Well, this wasn't civilization. We'd rushed too fast into the modern world, and what we'd created was chaos. <laughs> 